no, 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 not chapter, not Canto 3, Canto 6, Chapter 3. Yes. Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padekamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shcha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganad Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Shcha E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagat Pate Gopi Shah Gopi Ka Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchita Gaudangi Radhe Vrindavaneswari Rikabandhu Suti Devi Pranarami Hari Kriye Panchakalpa Turu Vizja Kripa Sindhu Pe Vajja Tita Nam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadat Har Sivasati Gaur Bhaktivindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. So Srimad Bhagavatam is a series of verses starting with this verse for the next five verses. Concluding this, there are five verses. So uh, we'll begin and maybe we'll go through a few of them and just hit on some of the major points of each one. Etavan eva lokeshmen humsam dharma para smitaha bhakti yoga bhagavati tam namah grahanadi bihi Translation A devotional service beginning with the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is the ultimate religious principle for the living entity in human society. Srila Prabhupada's purport. In the previous verse, real religious principles, the principle described in Bhagavatam, also in Gita, and the preliminary study is Bhagavatam. What are these principles? Dharma, Projito, Kaitavo, Tra. There is no cheating religious system. This is Bhagavatam. It's connected directly to the Supreme Lord, Vasavai Pum Santaro Dhamo. Supreme religion is that which teaches his followers how to love the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is beyond the reach of experimental knowledge. Such a religious system begins with Tam Namagraha, Nagrahana, chanting of the holy name of the Lord. Kirtanam Vishnu Smartam Padasevanam. After chanting the holy name of the Lord and dancing in ecstasy, one gradually sees the form of the Lord, the pastimes of the Lord and the transcendental qualities of the Lord. This way, one fully understands the situation of the personality of Godhead. One can understand to this, uh, one can come to this understanding of the Lord, how he descends into the material world, how he takes his birth and what activities he performs. One can know this only by executing devotional service, as stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhaktiyamam Abhijananti. Simply by devotional service, one can understand everything about the Supreme Lord. If one fortunately understands the Supreme Lord in this way, the result is Taktva Deham Purna Janmani Naiti. After giving up this material body, he no longer has to take birth in the material world. He returns back to Godhead. This is the ultimate perfection. Krishna says in Gita 8.15, Mamu Petya Purna Janma Dukalayam Ashashvatam Nap Nuvanti Mahatmanaham Sam Siddhim Paramam Gata. After attaining me, the great souls who are yogis in devotion never return to this temporary world, which is full of miseries because they have attained high, the highest perfection. So there is two essential principles here. Actually, there are more than two, but there are two essential ones. Is that out of all the processes 
in existence, the, the uh, execution of what is called bhakti yoga, also known as devotional service, also known as sanat and dharma, um, is the means by which one can attain perfection of life. Sometimes people mistakenly conclude that there is no goal in life and one, the only goal of life you have is what goal that you uh, describe for yourself. So each individual can describe their own goal in life and then that becomes their goal. So they don't uh, think that there is a particular goal of life because people are acting in, in different ways and living in different situations and striving for different uh, uh, benefits or successes. But actually, uh, everything is beyond the phenomenal material existence. Phenomenal material existence is a mixture of the energies of the Lord, known as passion, goodness, and ignorance, which pushes the living entity to think and act in a certain way in order, and then to desire accordingly, and to try to get the benefit of that desire through those activities. But there's an activity that is meant as the foundation to bring success to all that ones of activity, and that is loving service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This loving service is natural because of our actual connection with the Lord. Who, although we appear to be disconnected from the Lord, although we appear to be somewhat distant from the Lord, although it, it, it appears to the conditioned souls that the Lord and us are separated, none of these things, these things are just appearances. We are never separated from the Lord. We are always connected from the Lord. And there's no question of being distanced because Krishna is there within our heart. So life centers around devotion to the Lord because life is meant to achieve that goal. So this verse illustrates the process that is the process of perfection. People strive to become successful in some particular occupation or learn a particular uh, subject matter or achieve something in this world that is noteworthy and become uh, what we say famous for that. Or people just in general, because in this age it's more this in general attitude is that people just think that if you can somehow satisfy your senses, then um, you achieve happiness. And so to be expert in sense gratification, learning how to go for that sense gratification, that is the higher forms of sense gratification, rejecting the lower forms, which cause misery and suffering, the higher forms cause delayed misery and suffering. They don't have, come right away. They come in due course of time, but people can't see that. So they think, well, if we can enjoy our senses and we can connect a whole series of activities that that connect sense gratification as the uh, as the happiness as happiness then this this is the success in life so the world is full practically everyone has their own idea what is what is life how to live it what is the purpose of life? Some people say there's no purpose. There was one person whose name was Albert Camus. And the kids study them in schools and in high schools and even in colleges. He kept saying that there is no purpose in life and your only purpose is that it's purposeless. And therefore, if you define a purpose in life, then you have a purpose. Otherwise, there's no purpose. And he wrote one book, Life is Meaningless. <laughs> and uh, he wound up committing suicide. That was his, uh, you know, end result of his philosophy. He, he saw everything was useless. But you have to understand one thing that even though it seems qu he's quite ridiculous, he understood one thing 
he understood that material life is useless or has no real goal and purpose, but he couldn't understand that there is something beyond material life. And therefore, uh, he turned into being a, a nihilist. They call it nihilism, nihilism, where everything is just void. And if you can enjoy, that's nice, but you can't enjoy all the time because it's obvious. So everyone has these uh, concocted ideas of what the goal of life is. But you have to hear the goal of life from an authority, and then you have to find that authority that is the, that is the acceptable authority. So unless people accept God, there's some people who don't accept God, they'll never accept any authority. And if they do accept an authority, it's something that suits their desires for happiness in this world. But there is a supreme authority, and that is Krishna, and the supreme personality of God. Whether you call him Krishna or call him any other form, a name that indicates the supreme, it, one has to receive knowledge from, from that source. And that source is the source of all other sources of knowledge. And so when one can find that one, one can, one can find someone who connects to that original source, that source is also bona fide. And that is the great saints and the great spiritual teachers. And therefore, they all conclude simultaneously and they co collaborate with each other that the goal of life is to know God and to love God. That is the actual goal of life because we can see even on this level, people are interested in gaining knowledge. So through that knowledge, they, they gain some kind of... Uh, success in life or they actually develop a type of intellect that allows them to move through life with less amounts of suffering. And then we see that beyond knowledge, there's another principle that is called love. So everyone is trying to find love. Most people don't know what love is. They think love is uh, satisfying your senses in relationship to someone else who's doing the same thing. And they call that love. The attraction for my own sense gratification uh, comes in the form of finding someone who is of the same nature. And then we both try to satisfy each other's senses. And because we are attracted to each other in, in order to satisfy our own senses, they call that love. But the scriptures give it a different name because it's it's personally motivated. It is not love, but it, it is called calm. Calm in Sanskrit simply means lust or selfishness. So selfishness and love are two opposite principles. So real love comes when one finds the source of love, and that is that same source is the source of everything else, and that is the Supreme Lord. Then one can uh, begin to awaken that desire to love, because the desire to love is there. As Srila Prabhupada would often say, if a person will try to love something not even uh, animate, the, the I love my country, so what is that supposed to mean? It's kind of a nebulous de definition that doesn't really have any clear understanding. Well, what is this idea of country? Well, the place I live in. So I love my place of birth. But then again, there's so much variety in that place that how can you define it in one particular way? You can. So you call it a country or a nation or something. Or I love my community, people of the same culture as me people of the same ethnic uh, categories as me. And so people have different, or in family, because I have produced children. Um, I love my children because they are an extension of my body and therefore they're coming from me. And uh, I produce them in order to experience happiness in relationship to um, other living entities who are coming from me. And therefore, one starts to see themselves through their children. 
this happens as you get older, one lives through their children and sees their children more or less as an expression of their own desires. So then they start to love in that way. So this loving propensity, and then of course you can take it farther as Srila Prabhupada does, that one can love like, try to love animals such as dogs and cats and you know, rabbits and other things. So people develop an affection. You'll see even sometime when people die, if they have a dog or something, they leave a large amount of money to the dog. So the dog has, a, has good care when they leave. He's not neglected. The dog has, gets all kinds of nice things. And people have left their, their, some, of their, uh, some of their equity to, the, to dogs, cats, and other places. Or they love a particular type of uh, experience in life. Like I know one lady, one devotee, his mother, she, she was very attracted to opera. So when she, she, before she died, she willed a large part of her estate to one opera house <laughs> so they can continue their opera programs. You know, so people have this attraction to things. But real love means to repose your, one's affection in one particular living being. And love comes through the principle of service. So by serving the Lord, we get to know the Lord. And as we get to know the Lord, we get to, we get to attract, we get attracted by the Lord. As the attraction increases, we want to hear more about the Lord. And through hearing that attraction very strongly and continues to develop where that attraction turns into affection. Because although we don't know, we appear not to know anything about the Lord, still the Lord is situated within our existence as an eternal factor of our, of our life. And what we're doing, we're uncovering this hidden treasure of our own love for, for God who's situated within our own heart. And as that infection reaches a certain level of, of uh, intensity, it turns into pure love. And the expression of love is service. The expression of love is service to please the beloved. We see that every day when people want to uh, do something to show their concern, their love, their anything towards another person. They'll figure out what that person needs or what that person likes, and they'll do something in that way. And these are indications of love. When it's done without any desire for personal reciprocation, then it's, it, it comes to the level of purity. But when it's done with motivation to get something, even if you want recognition from that, then it's tinged. And then it's no longer really love itself. Because love is selfless. And so to love Krishna is natural because that is our nature. Nature, when we say nature, we say spiritual nature. So then the question is how to awaken that love. And this verse also indicates that awakening that love is by chanting the name of Krishna. Because the chanting brings the presence of Krishna in, in the form of sound. So sound is very powerful. Sound is transformable. Even material sound transforms a person's consciousness accordingly. When you hear music, you feel light if it's music in the mode of goodness if you hear music in the mode of passion it inspires you to uh, your lusty desires become stronger and your consciousness changes in that direction and if you hear music in the mode of ignorance you feel unhappy so the sound and of course if you live in a noisy place and that noise is continuous, like I know some places are like that, and then one feels disturbed all the time because the sound vibration uh, is kind of continuously coming in. 
So one develops a particular consciousness accordingly. So, but transcendental sound vibration and chanting the holy name directly connects one to the spiritual platform. Um, I have to let my assistant in. He's knocking out my door. I'll be right back. <laughs> Sorry about the interruption. So Krishna appears in different forms of himself because he's not limited. Material means limited. Spiritual means unlimited. Uh, material means length, breadth, and width. It can be measured where, well, even on the subtle platform, you can't measure the subtle energy of the material, but still it is measurable with finer instruments, but spirit is never measurable or never limited. So that's why when you say Krishna's name is Krishna, it's actually logically understood because spirit has no limitation. So therefore, when we're chanting the holy names of the Lord, we're actually associating with the Lord through pure sound because God is pure and his name is pure. So the problem is, we chant in the wrong state of consciousness. We chant to get something from the chanting. We chant maybe to improve our material or spiritual position, or we don't chant properly. We chant without clarity of sound, or we, we interrupt our chanting with other activities. Um, Therefore, there are so many anomalies that are introduced by way of the association with the external environment into our chanting, which makes the chanting less, um, what we say, powerful or potent. And therefore, one has to chant without offense. <laughs> and to avoid the fences means to come to the stage of tasting the happiness of chanting. So this chanting is, is very powerful. It can be done anytime, any place, anywhere. It's not limited. As prescribed by the spiritual master, there is a, a sankhya. A sankhya means that we count. We count a, a particular amount of names that we chant. In order to establish a, a vow, and that vow allows us to make to continue to chant each day. Sometimes devotees say, well, why do we have to keep counting chanting? Why don't we just chant? Well, you can do that, but generally when you make a vow, then you then you're chanting every day at a regular number. And this regular number of chanting it allows you to increase the quality of your chanting. So this counting, it was done by all the Acharyas and it was especially emphasized by uh, Srinivas Acharya when he was glorifying the six ghost swamis in his prayers to the six ghost swamis. You know, Sankhya Purna, in one verse, he talks about how they were counting the names on their beads with counter beads. So this, this counting it must be done like that. And as uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Dakor, one of the foremost commentaries on the, the science of pure devotional service explains, 
that if you chant every day, you will eventually come to the point of chanting always. So here is where we are culminating, is that we want to uh, stay in contact with Krishna. The whole goal of spiritual life is to connect our consciousness with Krishna. Krishna manifests himself in so many ways of himself, but some are less direct and some are more direct. And the ones that are more direct are more easier to focus on and more recommended for spiritual advancement, such as the deity, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the holy name, like that. These are more direct processes of connecting with Krishna. And by chanting the holy names of the Lord, we start to remember Krishna more and more because the name becomes a feature of recall. Then when we actually hear the name, we think of Krishna. We think of Krishna's form. We think about something about Krishna that we are familiar with. And then that, that solidifies our consciousness, purifies our consciousness where we're starting to move outside of the realm of material into a string of thoughts and activities which are all based on spiritual and on the spiritual energy, which are all centered around chanting his name. So here in this verse, Yamarad says that the chanting of the holy name is pretty much the essence. And he, 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 he mentions that is the essence of the process of bhakti, particularly in this age where Lord Chaitanya has given that feature emphasis by his own, by his own chanting and by his own words. Nam nam akardi bahuda nija sarva shaktis. That this chanting is the process of constant remembrance of Krishna. So sometimes people say, well, how do we meditate on Krishna? Well, here it is, chant. One can chant anytime, any place, but try to perfect one's chanting through the practice of chanting. So it's nice to take time and just sit down and chant, even aside from your regular numerical vow, chant, you have a little extra time or you make a little extra time in your day pick up your beads and chant, chant for an hour, chant for some time, and try to absorb yourself in the chanting. And uh, you'll see the transformation of your consciousness. And at the same time, there's an upliftment in the spirit. We start to feel more connected with ourselves. And that connection with ourselves is actually the connection with Krishna in the heart like that, because he is the self of all selves dwelling in the heart of us. Uh, the self is not the body. The self is the soul within the body. And therefore the self, the self contains another person and that is Krishna known as Antaryami or indwelling feature of the Lord within the heart or on the heart. The soul exists within the body on the heart. Mm -hmm. That's why we say love for God is coming from the soul because the soul is situated right on the heart. It's in that area, that region of the body where, uh, uh, so that's why when people want to show love, they talk about heart emotions rising from that section. The body is just a series of, not series, but a combination of various chemicals and ingredients that are all material. So even if you put them all together, you can't create emotions. Emotions are coming from the soul because the soul is sentient and pure and it is not divided into itself. It is a whole spiritual entity which has a natural loving propensity to the, for the Lord. So when that propensity comes out from the soul area, which is in near the heart, and is directed towards material things, then we find it, we find attraction or affection for those things. But when it's directed towards Krishna, then it becomes fully developed in its natural state.
before it's filtered, before, just like you take light. If you take light, just like if you have sunlight, but if you put a, a colored glass on your window, the sun will filter that, uh, that light will be filtered through the color and it'll appear in that color. But if you have the clear glass, then the gla then you see the you see the light as it is. So in the same way, that light, which is our natural love for Krishna, comes through when we direct that that love towards Krishna. <laughs> it's meant for Krishna, and when it's directed towards Krishna, we we get to we get to connect with Krishna. Or we get to realize Krishna. Yeah. So try to see that um, we have something very precious that's been given to us, free of charge, without any requirements, and that is Krishna's holy name. It, it is the panacea for all problems in this age, and it's the elixir that nourishes all of our desires for happiness. This is Krishna's holy name. And so as Bhakti Vinod, and it says that uh, Sanatan Goswami writes that actually one doesn't even look towards any other form of worship, such as meditations or various types of worships as mentioned, when they are connected nicely with the holy name. The, the holy name becomes their worship their sadhana, it becomes their sadhana, it becomes their seva, it becomes their sadhya. All three are found, are connected when one becomes attracted to chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And we have the example with Srila Haridas Thakur, who showed by example the process of chanting the holy name, where his whole sadhana was simply the holy name. He would chant uh, 333,333 names of God, which is 192 rounds a day, every day. And because he was so attracted to the holy name, he had developed a purity in chanting. And that purity means that he was spontaneously ch chanting the holy names. Uh, when one comes to that level of chanting, and it's possible even in this age, um, then the holy name, it's, it's almost like it's effortless. When we're chanting day to day, we make an effort to hear, we make an effort to chant properly, we make an effort to purify our, our motivations when we're chanting. But when one comes to the spontaneous, it's called sarasrika, or swarasrika, I think, swarasrika, sarasrika, yeah. Uh, that means spontaneously chanting of the holy name, then it's almost effortless. The name just keeps coming, and one is chanting, but the name is actually doing everything. As it's mentioned, there are there are three people involved when you chant you, the soul, Krishna, the Supreme Lord, and the Holy Name. All three are there. There's a distinction made between Krishna and his Holy Name. And it says that the three dance together. It's like a, uh, it's like a transcendental experience of happiness where Krishna is there. Krishna's name is there, both are the same, but both are distinct in one sense because the holy name is coming through the mercy of Krishna and it's Krishna also, but he appears in his holy name, so, but he's giving his holy name also, so there is a distinction for the sake of explanation only. That's the only reason for the distinction. And then there's us who is receiving the sound vibration. I think we can honestly say that each and every devotee that had, had, has had experiences in their Krishna consciousness where they have been chanting and the holy name has been so powerful, where it's almost effortless. 
and it just keeps coming. It's clear. It's even, even if you're not saying it audibly, you can hear it in your mind. It keeps coming. It just keeps coming. I'm sure all every devotee in one, at least in one time in their practice of Krishna consciousness has tasted the sweetness of the holy name when it simply flows into their hearts and minds. Um, some people say, well, that is Krishna's mercy. It is, but others understand it as being that your consciousness was in the perfect state of receptivity at that time for whatever reason. And so it, and this is a very, a very important uh, point to understand, making our conscious receptive. And that's why early morning chanting has an advantage because the day's conscious, the day's thoughts are not so cumbersome or so necessary at that time. So it may, that's why we chant early in the morning because we're more receptive to the sound vibration. So simply practice, 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 and chant more and chant always. Um, I have compiled a series of quotations by Srila Prabhupada's lectures and his books where he makes the statement, chant always, chant 24 hours a day. And I've had, I have numerous statements. I was just, just last night, I was giving a class in the temple on the Bhagavad Gita 927. Where Krishna says, yad, kar, yad karosi, yad anasi, yad jahosi, dadasi, yad, yad tapasi, kauteya, tat kurusham mararpanam. In the purport, Prabhupada said, one should chant 24 hours a day. <laughs> He's not saying this is some nice cliche or to make it sound so, you know, grandiose. He's saying it is that this is actually the goal of devotional service is to remember Krishna 24 seven. And here's where that remembrance begins and develops. And then as we hear and hear and read about Krishna's leelas, from books like Srimad Bhagavatam, Jaiva Dharma, um, Govinda Lilamita, uh, Jiva Goswami's, uh, uh, what is that word? Jiva Goswami's, uh, it slipped my mind right now. Jiva Goswami's, who remembers that work by Jiva Goswami? Uh, can't remember it's a beautiful beautiful narration of Krishna's pastimes but it's not in the same order given in the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, I, I just finished reading it about six months ago it's really nice uh, so yeah when we add these two principles together Sometimes devotees say, well, you know, I'm chanting. What else can I do? Well, here you go. When you hear and chant the glories of the Lord, his leelas, then everything, there's where you take off in your Krishna consciousness because your natural attraction for Krishna will be awakened. Like that. Gopal Champu, that's the work by Jiva Goswami, Gopal Champu. And then, of course, Ananda, uh, Ananda Vrindavan is another one by Kavi Karapur, like that. So many books that delineate Krishna's leelas. And Krishna's leelas are sweet. This morning I was reading the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And, and this is in the section where Krishna's killing Putana. Sakatasura, so I was reading about Sakatasura, the cart demon this morning. And they were saying that Prabhupada was saying that Krishna's pastimes as in this in this particular, in other words, his leelas in Vrindavan, he exhibits his full potency as opposed to his uh, incarnations as 
Korma or Matsya or uh, Varaha, like that. These are more Leela avatars. But when Krishna comes as Krishna, and the past time I was reading, whereas when Krishna was just a tiny little baby, hardly one years old, he was sitting underneath this huge cart, which was filled with all kinds of household utensils. And then there was a demon who took the form of a ghost. He was in the form of a ghost and he entered into the cart. And his idea was to kill Krishna. And Krishna just decided to knock the demon out. So he kicked the cart very softly with his foot, but the cart just broke and the axle cracked, and the wheels fell off, the cart came crashing down and all the utensils went scattering. Everyone was wondering what happened, but no one could understand that this little child whose tender little foot is, was, as is described in that pastime, it was as soft as new, new green grass, just touched the cart and the whole cart just exploded. <laughs> so Prabhupada was saying, yeah, this if Krishna in his Leela as Krishna, he carries the full potency of the Godhead with him and he brings it with him. All the potencies of the Godhead are manifested, are, are available, or we, we say are found within any of the incarnations, but they don't, a lot of these other incarnations don't manifest these past, these, these, uh, this potency. It's only Krishna who manifests, and especially in his childhood pastimes, they become the sinosaur or the focus of the devotees because they're so sweet. Krishna's past, pastimes as a little child. So, uh, yeah, uh, by reading and hearing these wonderful pastimes and chanting the holy names of the Lord, we can go back home, back to Godhead in this life. There's no other process needed. Hare Krishna. Jai Gurudev, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful verse uh, and you talked about uh, uncovering the treasure of uh, our own love uh, within our hearts. I personally found so many points to talk about chanting to new people today. So um, thank you so much. Um, Hare Krishna. Dear devotees, if you have, uh, please unmute yourselves to ask any questions or share your realizations. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Shilpa, Hare Krishna. Jai Ho. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to you. So yesterday at our Sangha, we had this uh, question which baffles, still baffles so many devotees. And it's a question about um, why do we uh, perform so many prayers and even chanting when a soul is departed? And the question was, where does our chanting, if we're chanting, are we chanting for the departed soul? Because all we see is the material body. So can you just explain further on that and reference where we can read further on this chanting well, of the soul? The soul has an attraction for the body. So when the body is gone, the soul sometimes hovers around the body and stays there and wants to re-enter into the body. So one of the reasons, one of the main reasons is to move the soul on to its next destination. Yeah. And there's been experiences like that where a soul can't move on because it is still trying to get back in the same body it left because of its attachments. So to ensure that that soul moves to its next destination, especially in, the, in we call it in devotional circles, we chant and, and that chanting helps that soul to move on to where it's supposed to go.
in an auspicious way. Thank you for that. But there was also a question whether, I don't know whether a devotee read something somewhere, but it was a question about whether Yamraj ever gets it wrong and whether um, a body can come back to life, if that makes sense. There's just one story in relation to that, but then there was there were certain ingredients in the story that illustrated that Yamaraj made a mistake. <laughs> but Prabhupada talks about that one story. Usually he doesn't. And that was the story of Savitri Satavan. Savitri and Satavan. You can read it. In the, um, let's see, you can do a little research and find out the story of Sivitri Sattva. It's a long story, so to speak about it now is, would take up too much time, but yeah, Yamaraj was baffled <laughs> in this particular situation. So the story centers around someone trying to beat death. But nobody can beat death because death is, is the all-powerful force. But the only ones who can beat death are devotees because they can, devotees don't die. They just simply transform their existence to another, to a higher existence. That's all. Death is for the non-devotees because they live for the body, therefore they die. One who doesn't live for the body doesn't die. But in that one story, it's, it just illustrates very nicely. So Vitri was a very chaste lady and because of her chastity, she was also, she was able to save her husband Satavan from death. <laughs> That describes the benefit of having a chaste wife. <laughs> chaste wife can save her husband from so many problems, calamities, even from death. Gandhari did that with to Peter Astra. Because of her chastity, she actually saved her husband, Peter Astra. Thank you, Maharaj. So I think the answer to that then is that chanting is the key, even for the departed soul. I mean, we chant for ourselves, but I think it's more important to chant for somebody else. Well, that's 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 a service that devotees can do for for another to serve another soul is a great service so this is one way to benefit another soul yeah it's a very nice way to use a simple word <laughs> Yeah, benefiting others is the nature of a human being. Yeah, but chanting is all auspicious. Whenever there's chanting and whenever there's pure chanting, the whole atmosphere is transformed. Mm -hmm. If one can remember Krishna at the time of death by chanting the holy name, then as Krishna says, then yam yam vapi smaram bhavam, 
Tatwa ante el calebrum, tam tam ivaiti contea, sada tada baba babi taha. And one will return to me. If you remember your children at the time of death, then you'll take birth again accordingly. If a husband remembers his wife, he'll get a he'll get a body in his next life as a woman. Just like I know one devotee, I won't mention her name, but she was a brahmachari in her last life. Um, this was in, she was an Iskan brahmachari, and um, yeah, I won't mention her name because maybe she won't want me to mention her name. But she's written about her story also because she remembers her last life. She was a brahmachari. But this brahmachari got attracted to this Indian lady. He was a Western brahmachari. He got attracted to this Indian lady. And he died in a car accident. Somehow or other, that same brahmachari came back in Iskand again as an Indian lady. <laughs> and she remembers clearly her last life. Clearly. And she writes about it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, now, so she's testimony that, you know, whatever you remember at, at the end of your last life, you become in the next life. Mm -hmm. Because the mind is what takes us to the next situation. So whatever the consciousness at the time of death, that's where that consciousness will take you. You remember Krishna? You go to Krishna. If you remember something in this world, you take birth in them. People become attached to their house and they make their house their object of worship. And then in their next life, they come back in that same house, but maybe not in a human form, maybe as a, a mouse in a hole in that house somewhere or a cockroach somewhere on, underneath the rug or something because of their attachment to the house, they come back again, but because they weren't, they, they couldn't merit a human body, they come in back in a, in a different body in the same house. Same with a car, people get so attached to their cars, they take birth as a, some small insect in, in their car. <laughs> That's why you have to re be careful what you think about and what you desire and what you put your consciousness on. That's why if we want success in life, we have to keep our consciousness connected to Krishna. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Further reading, Maharaj, what would you recommend on this subject. Specifically, what is your topic? What focus do you want me to? It was just something to take back to Sangha, really. Uh, more about this uh, passing of the body and uh, the journey, really, and what we're praying for. Oh, uh, well, the soul's you know, there's, there's verses in, the, in Bhagavad Gita, there's verses in Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna speaks in, in Gita, eight, in chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, chapter 4, verse 9. In Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, there are many verses. It illustrates, you know, where you go to your next life depending on your consciousness. Consciousness is the factor. What you think about is what you become like. <laughs> Mm 
you'll see when people think about another person in a very regular way, they actually start developing some of the characteristics of that person. People nowadays, they have so much affection for their dogs. And after a while, they start looking like their dog, really. <laughs> you can see that. So you get even you, you transformation on the physical level when you get absorbed in something. So imagine if you get absorbed in Krishna and you start taking on Krishna's characteristics and qualities. And apparently unattractive person, when they become Krishna conscious, they become attractive automatically. So yeah, do a little, Bhagavad Gita has many verses about transmigration of the soul from one, one body to another. Bhagavatam also. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Adiko. Thank you for sending your nice gifts. <laughs> Jai Ho. You're welcome, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Gurudev, I have a <clears throat> question. Um, you said uh, about Sanatan Goswami um, that um, he he said holy name is the only worship, and it and holy name became his sadhana, seva, and sadhya. Yeah. Um, so, um, could you talk more on that? Um, because sadhya is the uh, it becomes his goal you mean yeah yeah everything centers around sadhana means what we do in order to become purified savers is how we serve the lord and sadhya means the, the the result of of our sadhana and seva together mm -hmm. so then they all amalgamate into into the holy name The holy name becomes everything. The example is Srila Haridas Thakur. He's the prime example of that. The Sanatana Goswami writes about that. There's a there's a there's an actual statement by Sanatana Goswami. He's saying that you know the holy name has there's no need for any other form of worship. Everything is there in the holy name. Mm. But uh, we need for other forms of worship as we progress towards perfection in the holy name. So that's why Prabhupada gave us the whole process, which is a variety of spiritual activities. These things help to purify our consciousness so we can actually chant the holy name. But when you get to the stage of spontaneous chanting, that's all you do. You just chant. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. <clears throat> I, I really liked uh, um, when you said that uh, you know, when you actually chant, then three people are involved, the soul, the, the Supreme Lord himself and the holy name. Mm -hmm. And they dance together. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that, that's the that's the actual statement. Yeah, that's very be beautiful, very nice. I I remember my grandfather used to say when I was little that when you chant Vithal, uh, Vithal is actually dancing on your tongue. <laughs> um, but you can't see it. When you grow, you will see it. So we would just chant. <laughs> he, he was chanting Vitala Vitala? Yes, Guru there, yes. Hmm. When you start chanting Vitala Vitala, you get attracted to chanting that. It's really very sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's very sweet. Yeah, I spent a, a quality time with uh, Lokanath Swami and both in uh, in Pandarpur and in uh, what's the other place where he is now based? Oh. Okay. Is it Na Nasik? Nas Nas. No, no, no. He's right now in Pandarpur. Yeah, Pandurpur, but there's another place where he established a temple. Aravde, Shri Devi Mataji Singh Aravde, yes. That is his hometown. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Ara, Ara, yeah. Yeah, so I spent quality time there, and Maharaj, she has a real attraction for Vitala. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else has a question or realization? Uh, yes, Arjuna. Please, if I may. Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. Thank you for this, uh, another wonderful lecture on the holy name and uh, how important it is to chant with attention. So my question is how we can increase our attention to the sound of Krishna's holy name um, rather than make it very intentional rather than a mechanical thing that we have to do every day. You know, this is my vow, I'm chanting, but I'm not really chanting. Well, mechanical <clears throat> means you, you really are just, it's just lip syncing. <clears throat> um, Prabhupada gives the simple form, he said, chanting is like a baby crying out for its mother. So that's, there's emotion in that statement. So one is in a fallen condition, separated from Krishna. One desires to connect with Krishna, to, to close that gap of separation by the presence of Krishna. So one calls to Krishna. So chanting is like calling. In fact, the whole mantra is in the mood of a vocative. It's calling out to Krishna. Hare is, is the, is invocative. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. But for you, you need to speed up your chanting. <laughs> if you go a little faster in your chanting, you'll find it'll be easier for you to concentrate, easier for you to concentrate. Because if we go too slow, we should go slow at the beginning. Like when I chant, my first round takes me 10 minutes. And then as I continue chanting, the, six, the rest of the rounds decrease in time <clears throat> until I get around six or seven minutes. <clears throat> but when we start off, it should be very, what we say, methodologically done very carefully, clearly connecting the consciousness with the sound. As the connection is, is there, we can gradually increase the speed. 
when the absorption is done at the very beginning, it becomes easier to naturally increase your speed when we get interrupted. So your very beginning of your chanting is really your most important part because it sets the stage for the rest of the rounds. Mm -hmm. I know some devotees, not some devotees, I know some people who are living in in uh, Sri Mayapur in the villages, they teach chanting very, very slow for the first four rounds. And then as, it, as they get past the fourth round, automatically their chanting is absorbing and, um, and uh, quicker, much quicker. <clears throat> The idea is to get absorbed. And if you go too slow, of course you can go slow at the beginning, but if you continue on that slow pace <clears throat> and going in and out of consciousness, you'll find it, you, your chanting will become more mechanical. Mm -hmm. You always have to be watching and be how much aware you're, how, how much you're hearing the sound. <clears throat> And when the mind wanders, just bring it back to the sound. Don't allow it to wander. Even if it appears to be some important thing that you need to sort out in your life, you can do it later. Gurudev, we yes, have, thank you. We are um, like 20 minutes over an hour. Um, oh, would you okay. like to take uh, more questions? There are two more hands raised. Yeah, as long as the questions are there, we can keep going. Okay. Diptesh Prabhu, you would like to go first? Yes, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. Uh, thank you for a wonderful uh, discussion and uh, on the significance of the holy name because I think part of my question you have already answered through Sri Devi Mataji's question. But my answer, my question was, you know, we mentioned in the conversation that Mahamantra is free, um, and it is only through the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityanand Prabhu that it's manifested given to us um, so that mercy that's coming through how do we how do we absorb ourselves to make sure that we get that mercy because because it is readily available uh, because it's there we we sometimes take it too lightly yeah, well, and that's my the question problem. was yes Maharaj. yeah yeah and the eagerness has to be there and that way you'll always have the, the mercy will always be available if you're eager for the mercy. We have to be eager and we have to show that eagerness by our enthusiasm for chanting and for hearing. We should feel like if I'm not if I'm if I'm not chanting, then I'm wasting my time. <laughs> that's a that's a there's different things in our life we can that indicate whether we're eager or not. Another form of eagerness is to chant early. If we think there's more important things in the morning when we first get up, then our eagerness is, is marginalized. Mm -hmm. and that should be the first thing we do. Of course, I know some devotees, they read Bhagavatam for a little while and then they chant, but that's fine. But if you're tending to material things when you first get up and you're setting the stage for that consciousness throughout the day. 
So that's one of the ways to remain eager or to show eagerness is chant early, to read about the holy name and the glories of the holy name. That's another form of eagerness, which brings about Gornitai's mercy. To take the holy name and give it to others. That's another form of eagerness. So we can show our, our eagerness in different ways. And then we're guaranteed that there will always be mercy available. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. I think that was very, very uh, helpful because my que next question you answered in detail about how do we get eagerness. So thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Namrata Mataji? You are, uh, you are not clear, Mataji. Can you hear me? Can, you can type your question if you want. Hello. Not, yes, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, it's just the uh, 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 Shilpa Mataji asked something about the uh, after uh, the prayers uh, during uh, somebody's death. So it is just a realization I'm sharing that uh, still many in many places uh, in India and you know even uh, abroad, uh, abroad uh, people do do kirtan after the after a death of a person and uh, that is uh, uh, we have a very beautiful bhajan here that we used to sing and nowadays I see that uh, now these type of kirtans, you know, they are like, people are cutting off those rituals. So it, it is a very sad thing uh, for me, which I have realized that they should do this kind of kirtans after, uh, you know, the dead people, uh, the dead person. Yeah. Uh, there is a, there's a very beautiful Anjali Geet uh, you know, uh, which is in Gujarati actually, but it is very, uh, it has very nice uh, lyrics. Uh, I don't know, you might not uh, get the Gujarati, but I just, I'll just give you a, a quick short translation of it. That, uh, the, uh, that is a kind of Geet or a Bhajan you say, uh, that we sing after that person, after that soul. It says, with two hands joined together for the departed soul, that it may attain your lotus feet. That is only what we pray from the bottom of our heart. Uh, through, uh, through his, it means uh, the person's karma, through his own, own karma, in whatever kul, uh, it may be reborn. He may develop only your bhakti, cutting all the bondages of the karma. We don't pray for the moksha of that soul, or we don't pray for the for his pleasures in the swarga loka. But we just pray for a rare uh, body of a bhakta that he uh, attain. And get a chance to see your original form in his own uh, in his heart. So nice. this is a, yeah. So this is a very nice uh, song uh, that we do sing when there. Can you sing it in Gujarati? Uh, yes, the the song is the Paramatma e Atma ne Shanti Sachi Apju. So it, it's a nice long uh, bhajan and I, I it's dearly loved it. Mm -hmm. And you really you you really get tears while you're singing for that soul, especially when you're singing for your loved ones, for your dear ones. 
you really yeah, nice. want that uh, state for your loved ones yeah nice what is the name of it again uh, that is called uh, anjali geet and uh, it is um, i have read it in smarnanjalika i think that uh, smarnanjalika is uh, i guess it is from rudra sampradaya I I'm, I'm not 100% sure but it is from Rudra Sampradaya and the wordings are paramatma e atma ne shanti sachi aap jo Shanti is mentioned there paramatma e e atma ne e atma ne paramatma e atma ne shanti sachi aap jo means please uh, shanti api please give the true peace to that uh, soul that's nice sweet and if it's done with devotion then krishna will will respond <laughs> yeah it's a very nice song yeah you can you can also dance to it right uh actually exactly telling you know uh, whenever uh, it is sung during uh, uh, someone is dead so usually you know you you just tears just roll out of your eyes when you when you are singing the <laughs> oh, so it's yeah it's joyful in an, in another way <laughs> yeah it is uh, you know, as if you are you know uh, you are giving your loved ones in the hand of uh, parmatma that please do take care of our loved ones yeah to benefit another soul is a great service yeah we always say yeah. that we always say with with the with the association of wonderful devotees then everything becomes so nice <laughs> yeah thank you namrata yeah thank you maharaj hari krishna <laughs> hari krishna gurudev no more questions on the chat um If you would like to end the call, we can end the call now. Okay. So yeah, we can end. Thank you very much, all the devotees, my obeisances, Vanchi Kalpa, through this chat, Pipa Sindhu, Veva Chat, Patita Nam, Pavane Bio, Vaishnava Bio, Namaha Namaha, Gaur Bhakti Bindu Ki Jai, Shri Lakshmi Ki Jai, Guru Maharaj Ki Jai. Okay, and uh, for the remaining of the months, uh, we'll be doing Lord Chaitanya Leelas mostly, practically every day, different Leelas and maybe uh, one Leela in a series of a few, three or four days. So we want to, we're, the idea is to prepare our consciousness for the appearance of Lord Chaitanya on the 28th of this month. <laughs> Hari Bol. Thank you, Gurudev. Hare Krishna. Archana Siri Ki Jai. No, Gurudev. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna. Guru Maharaj. Agni Dei, Agni. 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 Hare Bol, Gurudev. How is Radha Kunja Bihari? They are wonderful. <laughs> They are very merciful. <laughs> They moved to a new room yesterday. Good, 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 um, good. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a uh, Did you have a housewarming ceremony when you moved to your new house? Yes, we had it. Uh, uh, Yes, we had Griga Pravesh ceremony, and later we will have 
once after you know that COVID will finish, we are planning to do uh, uh, that uh, kirtan with devotees. Nice, nice, yeah. And and also we are planning to do sanghas at home. Yeah. So also we, def we definitely invite you to come. <laughs> it's on the list. Oh, I whole, thank you. I have a whole list of places I want to go as soon as Krishna lets lets me go. I'm ready to go. We'll be most fortunate to have you, Gurudev. Yeah. <laughs> be an experience for me. <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna.